Okay, well, wo welcome everybody. Um, our subject this morning is uh, can sustainable <coughs> development drive growth? How? What are the strategies? What do we know that works? What have we tried that hasn't worked? We're privileged this morning to kick off this panel, to have Secretary General Ban Ki-moon address us on this subject for a few minutes. Then we're going to go right down the panel, hear from everybody, and then open it up for a discussion. Secretary General. Good morning, everyone. Uh, distinguished heads of state and government, uh, participating as panelists, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. For most of the last century, Economic growth was fueled by what seemed to be a certain a truth, the abundance of natural resources. We mined our way to growth. We burned our way uh, to prosperity. We believed in consumption without consequences. Those days are gone. In the 21st century, supplies are running short and the global thermostat is running high every day. Climate change is also showing us that the old model is more than obsolete. It has rendered it extremely dangerous. Over time, that model is a recipe for natural, a national disaster. It is a global suicide pact. So what do we do in this current challenging situation. How can we create growth in a resource-constrained environment? How do we lift billions of people from poverty while protecting the planet and ecosystems that support economic growth? How do we regain the balance? All of this requires rethinking, sometimes out-of-box thinking. Here at Davos, this meeting of the mighty and the powerful, represented by some key countries of presence, it may sound strange to speak of revolution, but that is what we need at this time. We need a revolution, revolutionary thinking, revolutionary action, a free market revolution for global sustainability. It is easy to mouth the word sustainable development, but to make it happen, we have to be prepared to make major changes in our lifestyles, our economic models, our social organization, and our political life. We have to connect the dots between climate change and what I might call here WEF, water, energy, and food. I have asked the President Hallonen of Finland and President Zuma of South Africa to connect those dots as they lead our high-level panel on global sustainability. In fact, I have to tell you that President Zuma was here with us until yesterday evening, but because of unavoidable situation in African Union Summit meeting. He has to leave this morning, so he asked to convey his excuse and best regards to all of you. I have asked the panel members, high-level panel members, to take on the tough questions. How do we organize ourselves economically? How we manage increasingly scarce resources? Those same questions guide our discussions here. I have asked them, the high-level panel members, to bring us the good visionary recommendations by the end of this December, so that these recommendations can be fed into intergovernmental negotiation process until Rio Plus 20 summit meeting in Rio de Janeiro. But as we begin our discussions, let me highlight the one resource that is scariest of all, the time. We are running over, out of time. Time to tackle climate change, 
time to ensure sustainable, climate resilient green economy, green growth, time to generate a clean energy revolution. The sustainable development agenda is the growth agenda for the 21st century. To get there, we need you, your participation and your initiative. We need you to step up, spark innovation, lead by action, lead by example. Invest in energy efficiency and re renewable energy for those who need them most, your future customers. Expand clean energy access in developing countries, your market of tomorrow. Join our UN Global Compact, the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world. Embed those sustainability principles into your strategies, your operations, your supply chain. The government leaders sitting here and elsewhere around the world send the right signals to build the green economy. Together, let us tear down the walls, the walls between the development agenda and the climate agenda, between business, government, and civil society, uh, between global security and global sustainability. It is good business, good politics, and good for society. In an old day, what we really thinking, talking about is going back uh, to the future. The ancient saw no division between themselves and the natural world. They understood how to live in harmony with the world around them. It is time to recover the sense of living harmoniously for our economies and our societies. Not to go back to some imagined, imagined the past, but to live confidentially, confidently, confidently into the future with cutting edge technologies, the best science and entrepreneurship has to offer to build a safer, cleaner, and greener, and more prosperous world for all. There is no time to waste, and thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you. Secretary General, thank you very much. You know, uh, President, uh, former President of Costa Rica, Jose Maria Figueres, has a saying I like, which is that uh, there's no planet B, so plan A better work. Uh, President Hallinan, could you bring us up to date on how plan A might work? So, uh, thank you. As um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon already mentioned, so uh, President Chuma and I, we have taken a risk um, co -chairing, for co-chairing this uh, panel where we have a couple of members already with us uh, in order to find uh, a new paradigm or, or find uh, new ways to, to foster a positive development. Because we all know that, that we have this uh, modern trinity, what we need, which is that uh, the growth, economic growth, is welcomed. But it should be with the social justice, and it should fit also in the ecological frames. Uh, so um, Mr. Ban Ki-moon already talked quite, about, quite much about what we are lacking or, or what are the quite scarce resources. But what I would say is also that we have a lot of those unlimited resources what we can use. Uh, creativity, of course, but uh, also many other things in order to make uh, this world more harmonious. Uh, I think that our worst problem has been that in the, since uh, already 25 years ago, so-called Bruntland's Commission said that we need this kind of the trinity, uh, what I mentioned. But uh, the problem has been that uh, through the years we have noticed these uh, three different items in uh, very separated ways. We have, of course, we have the Millennium Goals, which is a social dimension. We have faced already the several economic crises, what we have tried uh, to, to uh, do it a bit better. But uh, the basic model is still something what we can expect to cause more such kind of the crisis. We had, of course, the ILO's World Commission concerning the social dimension of globalization. We all agreed, uh, all sides of the society, that we need uh, the fair globalization, which would uh, put more pressure upon on, uh, 
uh, jobs because uh, luckily enough, the people won't uh, get their bread, their, their earnings uh, uh, with uh, a decent job, both in the south and, and in the north. Uh, and uh, then, uh, of course, we have, have, we have become more and more uh, realizing that there is really only one planet and climate is a necessity for all of us. So, um, uh, of course, food crisis, oil crisis, financial crisis, all this every now and then awake us. But now we should find together the way how we can keep all these elements of this modern trinity together. Uh, yes, a good uh, economic growth, but in these frames, what I say, social justice, and also in ecological frames. I would put only a couple of things more. I would say that, for instance, concerning the energy, if we are keeping us in the traditional way using the energy or the using these uh, resources of the energy, so yes, we are lacking them quite much in the future, and we will cause also a lot of uh, side effects. But if we are more in green techniques, if we can find um, renewable energy resources, and if we can find also other ways how to, to be smarter in that. So we have a lot of possibilities. One thing more, if we uh, invest in people, I know I'm coming from the country which is lacking the gas and oil and uh, all such kind of, uh, and we have a pretty hard winter again. Okay? So uh, we know that investing in people, education, is one of the good answers, not only for the, uh, for the uh, research and the quality life, but it's also innovations, and it has also some effects in, uh, in, uh, in uh, birth rate and some other aspects, what I think Bill Gates, you cannot avoid that he will speak about that. Uh, but then uh, also I would say that uh, the gender. If you are looking at this panel, you hardly believe that Mr. Ban Ki-moon has made a different kind of the panel. This uh, panel of the sustainability, we have 50-50 concerning the women and men, and I think it would be one of the key answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jim Balsley, you're, you're coming from the uh, private sector. Uh, you're in a technology business. Half the people here are carrying blackberries, I'm sure. Two thirds. Um, two thirds? Okay. Um, you know, one thing we know about pollution is, pollution is waste. Uh, it's wasted money. It's wasted resources. What can you tell us from the way you develop your products now um, that might be applicable and scalable uh, for, sustainable, for countries thinking about sustainable development? Well, I mean, uh, uh, thank you very much. And, 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 and I think there's a little bit we can learn. And, and, and of course, you've got to do sustainable practices. And um, you know, it's not only how you make the products and, the, and, and, and also what goes into it, but also how you consume the infrastructure that it works with. But, but, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I think there are bigger questions at, at hand, really. Um, and, and, and so I, I think, you know, the, to start off, I think it's, it's remarkable that the, the forum tackled this issue early. Uh, I think the people here have done a, a remarkable number of things and, and obviously I'm honored to serve on, on the high-level panel with, which is being ably chaired, co-chaired with President Hallinan. But, uh, but... I, I think we have to ask ourselves some really uh, bigger questions than, than just business because if you look at the Brentland report, um, all the great things that business is doing in, 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 in these very good initiatives um, and all the great things that the forum is doing, the problem is far worse than it was 20 years ago and it gets worse at an increasing rate every year. So um, though we do things, um, I don't want to come here as a keeper of false positivism because um, and, and, I don't think I'm doing any real service to, to the issue. Um, I agree with the Secretary General and, and, and President Hallinan. I think we must be uh, extraordinarily ambitious here. Uh, I don't think we can be incremental. Um, I, I, um, George Soros and I announced uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking and our funding into it yesterday, um, my view is we have to fundamentally rethink economics. Um, you know, you've had waves of economics over the years. You, you had Adam Smith who kicked it all off. Then you had Keynes at a time when institutions were messing up. You had Friedman when we were in a, a crisis. 
and, and I think we're in an equal crisis right now. Um, I think the, the, it's a crisis of confidence in economics. The, uh, we didn't know how, we thought we knew how the, uh, the, the markets worked, uh, but we didn't with the crisis. So there's gaps in our understanding of economics. Uh, there's gaps in the global institutional apparatus. Uh, there's, uh, and also, how do we bring in public goods? And, and, and that's the Amartya Sen, Stiglitz, Sarkozy thing where they're, they're coming at this. This is an enormously uh, difficult thing to do. Um, and, and, and we don't know how to bring in uh, public goods into, into economics. Uh, we also, I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves here at this forum is what is the role of the forum in, in, a, in a problem that we know that's getting worse at an increasing rate, even though we're doing virtuous things. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think this is something, you know, do we redefine the role of the fiduciary? Because my job is a private fiduciary, but should I have a public fiduciary role? And should business have a public fiduciary role? And, and so I think... Answer know, that question. Well, I think we're in a pretty deep hole, um, and the measures we've been taking for 20 years have though they're very virtuous and they're commendable, the problem gets far worse every year. And the only question is, can you stop a runaway train? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, my personal thinking, yeah, absolutely, I think you should bring in the public fiduciary, the role. And I think you have to rethink economics. And, and I think you have to be wary of false positivism. And I also think you have to realize that tech is an engine that plugs into the framework that you give us. So if it's a framework of global conflict, they make technology tools for conflict. If it's, a, if it's an era of consumption and enjoyment that makes consumer tools, if it's a, an era of dealing with scarcity and factoring better management of public goods, tech will innovate to that. But don't think it's an answer into itself any more than markets are answers into themselves. And I think that recursive thinking is, is the very, very uh, dangerous one. But I think it's, it's a time of, of tremendous opportunity. I, I think you not only have to rethink economics, I think you have to rethink your institutions, I think you have to think your, your standards, your transparency, your measurement frameworks. And you have to remember, we've hit times in this world before where there's been enormously radical thinking in economics, in, in things like taking away slavery and eradicating smallpox. So, we are beings capable of radical rethinking. And, and anybody who steps back and looks at this issue says, you know, we're not dealing with this particularly well. And, and again, the one thing I'm going to say is to business, what is their role in this crisis when, we, when you know the very good things a specific business is doing is virtuous and corporate responsible and sustainable in its own element, and yet the problem gets far, far worse every year, any way you look at the math. Thank you. President Udiona, you're, you are, uh, thank you. You're a steward of one of the world's great tropical forests um, and uh, one of the world's richest pools of biodiversity. And I know you personally have been involved in this issue for a long time. How have you balanced Indonesia's aspirations for economic development uh, and its stewardship over its incredible environment? Yes, uh, that's our basic policy. On the one hand, we have to increase the welfare of the people by having economic growth. On the other hand, we have to protect our environment, including protecting our rainforest. Uh, what we are doing now is, of course, we need to have a strong, balanced, inclusive and of course sustainable economic growth. Uh, by the conventional wisdom says, by having the investment, uh, export, appropriate government spending, and also uh, household consumption. But of course, we need to realize that we should not uh, destroy our environment when food is coming, the energy, and our natural resources. 
So what we are doing now, and it's, it is also our government policy, in terms of protecting our forests, protecting the environment, we are con continuously conducting reforestation while avoiding deforestation. We are working very hard to combat forest fires. We are managing the pitland uh, that is found in many places in Indonesia. Uh, we are also conducting a national campaign, a national campaign to plant billion, one billion trees yeah. annually. Uh, with a strong belief that 35 years from now, our environment is not only getting back to normal, but we could uh, actually improve the overall situation in the uh, Indonesian environment. So I believe very strongly that we should not contradict between the necessar necessity of achieving economic growth uh, and the uh, obligation to protect the environment. But uh, it is a good, good, good session, uh, Mr. Friedman, because the topic is how to redefine sustainable development from the perspective of developing countries. I would like to suggest a few things. Please. First, if we talk about sustainable development in wider meaning, uh, it means we have to have continuous growth. It means we need stronger economic capacity over the years. That's our aim of economic development in Indonesia. Number two, we have to improve the welfare of the people. That's why we are committed to the achievement of MDG. Uh, it means less poverty. Uh, and we have to ensure that the growth is inclusive. We need equity, growth with equity. That's why we continuously empower our people, including introducing financial inclusions. So the small and medium enterprises, household, have good access to microcredit, just to uh, give the opportunity to have a better life. And in times of crisis, we need to think about building social safety net. Other factor is economic security. It means uh, the people need job security. Uh, and also we have to think about human security, how to overcome communicable diseases, for example, in developing countries in Indonesia, how to manage disaster that uh, happens many, many times in, in Indonesia, how to combat terrorism, how to uh, maintain our food security across the country, and last but not least, how to have a good governance and continuously uh, combat corruption. Two more factors is innovation. Uh, I do believe uh, in order the development to be sustained and sustainable, we need uh, technological innovation. We need to improve productivity, competitiveness. So if those things happen, it means our development will be self-generating. And all those factors must be connected to our obligation, moral obligation, obligation to protect the environment. So that's the cornerstone of, in my view, the uh, meaning of sustainable development. Thank you very much. Mike Duke. Walmart's probably got an economy bigger than um, several countries here at this meeting. Um, so it isn't, it isn't unfair to ask you this question almost from a national point of view. What can you, what have you learned about how one can marry profitability and sustainability? Sure. Well, thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. And I'm honored to be serving on this panel on this uh, very, very important topic. And pleased to uh, answer the question. I would say, first of all, uh, in particular related to emerging economies around the world, I think all of us would say that we are pleased that there would be rising middle class and, and people all over the world that are living better and a desire to live better over decades in the future. I'd also say, though, that all of us would share that with this will also come great challenges. Uh, we do know that energy costs, I would expect to rise continually over a long period of time. I think we could all expect that food and the, the demand for food will more than double. And with that will come many, many challenges for populations all over the world. 
So the challenges are immense, and it will require business, government, and all involved to be very aggressive in new, innovative ways to address these challenges. So I think business does play a very, very critical role. Business has a great responsibility, and business should not view this as a conflict between serving shareholders because, in my mind, there is not a, a debate or a conflict here of doing what's right for business and also doing what's right for the world and the future. The two will be necessarily should go hand in hand. I'd like to start a few things specific about Walmart and probably focus on food. I think there are a number of areas that we could spend time on, but even uh, an example last week, we had uh, an announcement in Washington, D.C. with First Lady Michelle Obama related to, to uh, health and wellness and specifically around food. And what we see in the United States, but in mature markets, but also in emerging markets, tremendous opportunity to create healthier food for our customers and healthier food that actually can cost less. A customer should not have to decide to, to, and to create their own decision about buying healthy food versus what they can afford. And affordability of good healthy food is a very important initiative that, that we're working on. There's a great deal of waste in the food supply chain, food from the farm that never makes it to the table. This is true in markets around the world, and we see that there's tremendous opportunity to reduce waste, create efficiency, and to have healthy food for families all over the world. And there are multiple approaches to doing this. And there should not have to be a conflict and should be able to help address the particular food issue. I'd say that at Walmart, uh, business leaders like myself and others inside of Walmart have really taken sustainability very, very seriously. It's now a critical part of our DNA, and I would say it's not just senior leaders. My desire, and I think we're on this journey, is that every one of our associates worldwide would be engaged in helping to participate in creating a more sustainable business and a more sustainable environment. We have over two million associates that work for our company all around the world in mature and emerging markets. We want every one of our associates to be engaged in this. And a real estate executive that's involved in stores uh, should be very conscious of sustainability in siting stores, in designing more energy efficiency. Our merchandising group works very closely with our suppliers to create sustainable products and to eliminate packaging and to reduce the waste involved. Our store operations, we have over 8,000 store locations. And in every location, we'd like our local management to be involved in recycling and involved in creating zero waste, but also in creating the most efficient delivery of product for their customers with many things like energy efficiency. So it should be a part of our DNA. The reason I believe that it's so critical is because I think our customers are going to now have an expectation, a demand. One of the things that technology will bring is more transparency. I believe in the future, customers will want to know what's the sustainability of every product. And we're working on with others in the industry what we call a sustainability product index that a customer could have available and understand the footprint, the, the knowledge about the background of any product that they purchase. And technology will enable that, but it will create even more responsibility for business and I applaud that. I'd say it's welcome, and it'll be a big, big step in that development. And business will play a critical role in the future. Thank you very much. President Calderon. I visited uh, Mexico City 10 years ago, and uh, air was incredibly dirty. I came back last year. It was amazingly improved. Uh, so I know the effort and the initiative your country's put into this. Please address this question from Mexico's point of view. Well, let me start with that, that part of Mexico City in particular. Well, one thing that you, you must do in a city like that, with 22 million people living there, is establishing a set of public policies, policies in order to improve the condition of the air, which is probably your concern. And that means to improve the massive transportation systems, change the quality of the gasolines, 
retire, even in a gradual manner, the subsidies to fossil fuels and to establish another kind of incentives, for instance, uh, thermical materials in new constructions and housing. However, let me address, in my point of view, the key issue about sustainable development. So the question is how to improve the conditions of the people, how to expand freedom and capacities of uh, the human being without jeopardizing freedom and capacities of the future generations. And as the President was saying, the key is to combine economic growth, equality, and of course protection, preservation, or even restoration of natural resources or natural capital. The problem is that we spend decades discussing uh, some kind of dilemma between economic growth and preservation of the natural capital. But now we need to find out how to break this gridlock or how to understand that there is a false dilemma and that it is possible to establish economic growth and at the same time uh, improve the equality of the societies. It is possible to, to promote economic growth and at the same time to preserve the nature and have environmentally friendly public policies. And the key issue is what are those measures, what are those public policies that uh, reach these goals at the same time? In my opinion, we have tremendous opportunity to do that through all those public policies or measures that could reach those goals at the same time. And first, we must promote all those measures that are able to improve energy efficiency. And that implies protection of environment, but also profits for business, um, better income for consumers. So any kind of measure in an enterprise that it is able to improve the efficiency of uh, the company, for instance, if you are able to produce the same or even more amount of uh, products using less energy, you will save money, and you will protect the planet. And the same with transportation. You can improve the quality and the quantity of a massive transportation system in a city. You could improve the quality of the people, but also you can protect the environment. And the same, you, the other sources to use renewable energy sources, which is another amazing business opportunity. Because it is possible to make profits in a society or to make profits in a company promoting renewable sources of energy. So, uh, in my opinion, we can split this kind of public policies or measures like in two or three parts. But one is, there are a lot of public policies and measures that actually, they have a positive net present value. I mean, long term implies good business. I can put an example, for instance, the substitutions of, of appliances, the old refrigerators or air conditioning equipment for a new one that implies saving money for consumers and saving, car saving carbon emissions for society. Uh, the other is establishing renewable sources of energy in all those countries that have tremendous potential in that. For instance, in the case of Mexico, we have probably one of the fifth best places in order to produce wind energy. Oaxaca. So we have a tremendous potential and we need to, we can save a lot of money and we can save a lot of emissions as well. And there are other measures that probably have not net, positive net present value, but uh, very important, uh, there, those are very important measures in order to save money and save, sorry, save uh, emissions as well. For instance, all the mechanisms established in the Red Plus instrument that we approved in Cancun last December. According with the Red Plus, it is possible to establish public policies in order to promote the preservation of rainforests and woods. And at, with this, for instance, in Mexico, we, are, we establish a system of payments for environmental services. So today, we are paying to the poorest rural communities, indigenous communities in Mexico, 
under the con we are paying a real income transfer under the condition that they could preserve the rainforest and even increase the natural resources they have. So in this way, we are preserving nature, and at the same time, we are improving the condition of the people and fighting poverty. So those, and even, let me tell you, even in several cases, is not only a measure of equality, is not only an environmental measure, it's also a profitable business. Because if you promote, for instance, plantations in all those places, it is possible to get very good profits and at the same time to preserve the natural resources and at the same time to improve the income of the poorest people. So, in brief, we must to implement at governmental level public policies in order to combine these goals, economic growth, equality, and preservation of nature. And at international field, today we have a new instrument, which is the new improvement of the multilateral arena after Cancun agreement, in which we establish measures in order to provide help for adaptations in poorest countries, to transfer technology and building capacity for them, to establish the uh, Climate Green Fund, which is new, and it is possible to mobilize uh, a lot of resources for those purposes. We establish and approve the Red Plus mechanism in order to preserve forestry. And finally, we establish real commitments in terms of mitigation. Only to, to close and to say this, under Kyoto Protocol, we got only a commitment of more or less 5% of reduction of, of emissions coming only from developed countries with the exception of the United States. And under the Copenhagen-Cancun Agreement, today we have commitments for reductions of emissions of 14% coming from developed and developing countries, including the United States and China. So there is a hope, there is a very bold and first step in the right direction, so, but we need public policies in the countries, and we need more political willingness at the international community. Thank you very much. Bill, you've had a chance to... Uh, thank you. <clears throat> You've had a chance to look at this both from the business side and the foundation side and your own work in the field. Give us your perspective. Well, I think <clears throat> the world's, word sustainability uh, can mislead us. You know, there's nothing that's staying the same. The world population is going to grow, and it's going to grow around a factor of 1.5. Now, if we do the right things for children's health, if we get vaccines out there, if we take care of uh, babies in the first 30 days, we can actually have a dramatic impact on what the peak population is, about 10%. And any way you measure that, whether it's the local areas where if you don't uh, reduce the population growth, you won't have enough land to grow the food, you won't have stability, the environment won't be maintained there, or if you just globally look at the avoided, say, CO2 by 2100, those health investments are far more economic than any other thing you could do having to do with the uh, energy system or anything else. So Investments in family planning. Uh, reproductive right. health, vaccines, taking care of babies, which mm. relative to many other costs uh, are, are quite small. And... You know, so that's a part I think is, is very exciting because it serves so many purposes, the, the health of those children, the local conditions, as well as the environment uh, in the long run. The, we definitely want people to use more services. We don't want to sustain the current situation where the bottom two billion use very little energy. We, that is, is just the wrong thing. And so there's going to be more energy use. Every year for the next 100 years, more energy will get used. And so the, what you have to do is look at the innovation that says that the unit of damage or problem per amount of energy used, that's where you have to have some mind-blowing breakthrough. Because after all, the, that energy factor, and even if you could play with it by 20%, we're talking about a need for about a 90% reduction in the current impacts there. And so you just, you're never gonna get it by thinking about the amount of energy. So if somebody looks at a product and says, oh, it uses this much energy, it, they better, the environmental footprint of that thing better be less in the future uh, because of the, the innovation. 
Now, innovation gets underfunded. Uh, you can't capture the benefits of innovation. And so it's very interesting as people get together to talk about these challenges, the amount they talk about the population reduction issues and the amount they talk about facilitating innovation is very low. And yet those are the two dominant factors uh, that will determine do we meet, uh, get to this thing in time. Take you know, innovation in food, food for the poorest. It's one of the most underfunded things. Green Revolution was funded by a, a few foundations and World Bank. There's a chance for a Green Revolution II um, that can double uh, productivity per acre. And that's another one of these things where you don't put acreage, uh, you don't use land you shouldn't use, you help the local farmers, you improve nutrition. So pretty dramatic benefits to innovation. And, you know, I think we can be optimistic about innovation because if you'd had this panel in, say, 1800, you know, and said, let's, let's, you know, people are living 32 years on average, let's sustain this. Or if you'd had this panel in 1970 when uh, the uh, people thought the population growth was out of control. Why, are, why is the picture we're looking at today so much brighter than if you looked for, uh, for sustainability at any time previously? It's because of innovation. And yet, we're not maximizing the cooperation, the investment, the tracking of the innovations, particularly those that would help the poorest, uh, which come in mainly health and agricultural things. I think we're slightly improving that. Uh, I think it is getting onto the agenda of people who think about either the food or, or climate issues. But I'm only optimistic because of that, that one element, not because we'll hold people back in terms of consumption uh, or that we'll avoid all population growth. We can, we can minimize that, uh, but it's the impact per person where the, the opportunity is. You know, your, your point, Bill, reminds me that uh, I've had several side conversations, one with a friend just walking in here, but with other business leaders that um, certainly the, one of the key engines of innovation has been the American economy. Um, and uh, we have so failed in the energy realm to put in place a clear framework to foster and nurture clean tech innovation. Um, and my, my question to you and all the panelists um, uh, is this. You know, this has been a very bad year for climate, as far as the United States is concerned. Climate change became a four-letter word in American politics this last year. Uh, it was not a part of the debate. Uh, one party openly mocked it. The other ran away from it. Um, we have this BAFO energy climate team, and they basically have been in a witness protection program um, for the last 15 months. Um, <laughs> Can we get where we need to go at the speed, scope, and scale we need? And please don't be polite here without a different approach to this issue by the United States of America. Because it is very possible, given our politics, we will not have a clean energy bill by the year 2013 at the earliest. Who would like to respond to that? Please, Secretary General. While we are discussing very important uh, subject of uh, sustainability uh, uh, development, I think uh, this uh, sustainable growth uh, should start from climate change. Uh, I said uh, jokingly that uh, there are other issues like uh, WEF, this is not the uh, World Economic Forum, water, energy, and uh, food. But climate change should be the starting point, the entry point of all sustainability uh, growth. Uh, without that, uh, I don't think uh, we will be able to meet all these uh, important uh, pillars. In fact, uh, during the last uh, four or five years, international community, while we have been enough uh, frustrated, but at the, at the same time, we have made the progress, as we have seen starting from Bali, then last year in Cancun, we made a good progress in red. This is a reduction of emission from forest and forest degradations. Members, key forest countries have made their commitment. And how to keep this red plus commitment sustainable, 
by providing some alternate sources of those people who have to depend their life by cutting, cutting wood. We have to have certain moratorium. I think that was a good a progress. We made a good progress in climate the financing. Uh, as you know, I have established the last year a high-level advisory group on climate change financing uh, led by Prime Minister uh, Stoltenberg of Norway and Prime Minister Meles of Ethiopia. They have provided good workable recommendation. $100 billion per year by 2020 for the developing countries so that they can adapt and mitigate these very serious consequences. Then we have again reaffirmed this Climate Green Fund, which has been very passionately promoted, initiated by President Calderon. Now we have a fund now. So we have to uh, make it uh, operational. Then there is a good agreement in technology transfer to developing countries. These are developing countries, they do not have any capacity. It's not their own making. It's making of mostly industrialized countries starting from United States and major uh, European countries. They have to provide this uh, technology uh, support so that they can again ad adapt and mitigate uh, their challenges. Adaptation and capacity building. On all these uh, five areas, we have made uh, progress. As we are discussing at this time on sustainable development, then there is uh, some questions raised. Are we not uh, tackling this uh, climate change? No, we are tackling. We are continuing to uh, tackling this climate change as uh, priority issues to make this uh, sustainable growth uh, possible. That is one thing, and I fully agree with what uh, President Hallonen said. Women empowerment is very much important. Then I would like to add this, when I say WEF, water and women. Women empowerment, when women are empowered, then you will have a much added value, much added productivity. The potentiality of women has been largely wasted and ignored. That is why the United Nations has established, from January this year, we have established very ambitious, super and major agency dealing with the women issues. Now, women empowerment means everywhere, in health area, education area, when mothers have care and attention on their children, we'll have a better educated children and healthier children. This will be the foundation. Therefore, let us look at all comprehensive way, broader way, more comprehensive way, like a study, starting from climate change, water, women, energy, and food. Now we are suffering from this rising food prices. Energy, I think many private companies, they have invested money in on renewable energy, uh, alternative energy sources. This is quite encouraging. Most of the countries now try to develop solar energy, wind power energies. This is quite encouraging, but we have to do more on uh, all other comprehensive in average way. But climate change is the entry point. Thank you. It, it certainly is the entry point, but I want to go back to my question. Would it be, um, uh, would, would we be entering that point at the speed, scope, and scale we need if the United States were more of a leader and not a laggard on this issue? You said we need not to be modest or... <laughs> if we want to be a little bit uh, critical, I think uh, this, can, this climate change campaign should be led, must be led by developed countries. This has started from industrial industrial revolution, the last, largely United States and European countries, they have to be morally, politically responsible. United States as the largest economy and superpower, the superpower of the world should take uh, political will, political leadership, and also investing in energy and other areas. 
President Obama has taken this issue very seriously. But I know some difficulties in American domestic politics. But this congressional support and business support to the administration, that will be key. Of course, that should be also followed by China, India, Brazil, major emerging economies. It's not something which you need other wait until others do something. You have to do your own homework before, why, before waiting other people should do. There is a certain, certain you know, psychological games between the United States and European countries and China, India, uh, Brazil. But they ask, you should do first. I think all the proposals are on the table. On the table. We know their positions, each other's position. I think they should be responsible uh, for the humanity. We have um, responsibility to keep this world, planet Earth, Earth sustainable. Uh, about 10 days ago, I was in uh, uh, United Arab Emirates uh, attending uh, World Future Energy Summit. There I learned a very moving, very powerful wording from, uh, from Yangu. What they said is that we have not inherited this planet Earth from our ancestors. We have just borrowed temporarily this planet Earth from our younger generations, succeeding generations. Therefore, we have political moral responsibility again to return this planet Earth to our succeeding generations in a more sustainable, mm -hmm. hospitable, environmentally sustainable way. Thank this you. is our responsibility. Thank you. President Helen, you wanted to dive in on this. If I say it, uh, this is not a provocation. It's only clearly said. So after the Copenhagen summit, when we were all were so disappointed, I say, come on, friends. Uh, with the previous year's uh, administration and government, we couldn't agree that we, whether it is a uh, climate warming or not. Now we agreed in that. Now we have had some difficulties to see that which kind of the steps we can get taken. I, I fully agree that everybody always wants that they could be the good girls of the class who are doing the homework and the others could continue their life as they have used to do it. But now the fact is that we have not another planet. We have only this one and it's not enough if the USA and Europe will do their work. And I, think, I don't see any reason why the South should uh, repeat our mistakes because it's not effective and it's not ecological and it's not even profitable in the future. So you can just jump over that and you will be better. Uh, so in that way I think that uh, uh, I have been also very, very happy that uh, those countries which uh, have a uh, uh, lot of uh, resources in energy, gas and oil and so of course, it's a benefit for them, but they have been more and more now also investing in the new forms of uh, energy, um, renewable energy resources, and I fully also agree that uh, efficiency in energy is one of those that uh, if we can be better there, so, so uh, uh, we do all, all that could because uh, it's costless, it's uh, cost less carbon, and, and uh, as long as we need it, it's effective. So uh, more, more and more, and I would say that I'm pretty optimistic what's coming to the balance between economic and ecological side. What I'm more worried is that all these bushfires we have, I mean in economy, so we have no time to really make a radical change. We know that, for instance, the international uh, Financial architecture has had all these difficulties. I think that uh, Sen, Professor Sen and Stieglitz and many others, they said already many, many years ago that we have these weaknesses. But before we are facing the catastrophe, we are not ready to change our habits. This is very human. It happens with everybody's individual welfare also. Um, as long as the doctor says that you should live better, you do it. Uh, some do it. But in the, in the day when you face what has happened, when you have not done this, you are ready to make all these changes, what is needed. And this is concerning our own planet too. Let's do it a little bit earlier. So um, 
I'm very happy for this discussion so far because we have, we have taken already, already the individual level, the consumer's power. We have taken an ent uh, enterprises. We have taken also the, uh, the, national, the importance of national states because we have to, to push them to do everything at the national level, local level and national level, but also to be more open for the global uh, discussion. So um, why not? Uh, Great. Well, thank you. Good start. Um, uh, can I? I'm going I'm to open the floor unless somebody wants. I'd like to open the floor to questions. We have a lot of people here, and I know they're burning with questions. Um, if you uh, stand up, identify yourself. We got a microphone coming, and direct your question right up here in the first row. The, the lady in red. Yes, my name is Song Ju Kim from Korea. I'm the chairperson of MCM Holdings. Um, just a spirit of Davos is very solution driven. So two suggestions for two solution uh, to action. One is, uh, Mr. Ban ki why don't you take on UN Digital Initiative for Women and Young Generation? I come from... Say that again, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Why digital we... Initiative uh -huh. for, from UN, mm -hmm. so opening up for women and uh, young generation. Because, uh -huh. you know, global Twitter, the power they can drive, reshape the world is uh, unbelievable. So why don't we, UN, give the tool and vehicle and the window to educate these consumers and individuals directly and also Op, let them to come up with an opinion how to, so is any companies or any countries doesn't listen or doesn't follow and just be super ego, we should uh, condemn them. <laughs> and also consumer, let them de determine, and also women, we care for the future generation. Therefore, if we can find solution, digital initiative for UN, for individual level, let's create a human web so they can really create like a million or even 10,000 people every day in a basis, we can really talk about the climate, all these issues reshaping you know, the future course and the world. That's what I want to suggest. Another suggestion to Mr. Bill Gates, in fact, this sustainability of an economy cannot be sustained without peace. If you look at the Korean Peninsula, which is my home country, North, South Korea, and we know this Yampyeong Island bombing, I think it is, uh, I think it's super uh, powers hegemonial struggle over the island as our current history 5,000 years shown. I think that instead of uh, just uh, going over six party talks, I think for me it's like a little joke. And why don't you say peace village between North and South and maybe your foundation can provide IT education for young kids from North and South come together, learn something, I think that could be wonderful initiative. So, and also, two Korean leaders I would like to suggest to come. Permanent peace treaty. That's what we need before well, Kim Jong-un dies that's away. That's very thank helpful. You. Thank you very much. Another question um, uh, that we have. Right here. My name is Elio Mather, Institute to Wakatu for Conscious Consumption in Brazil. Uh, Secretary Ban Ki-moon, mentioned in passing the need for lifestyle changes. Right now, 16% of humanity consumes 78% of the natural resources. If that lifestyle, which was driven by the developed countries, is disseminated to the whole world, no way we are going to solve for the sustainability problem. So I would like to know from you in the panel, from Mr. Friedman, uh, how to go about uh, lifestyle changes, which will be absolutely necessary. It's a good question. So, to the to who, who you know, President Calderon, you know, can can uh, um, if if the whole world adopts an American lifestyle, driving in American-sized cars on American-sized roads, eating American-sized Big Macs, um, <laughs> do we have any chance? Well, no. <laughs> And but, but the, this person is right. We need to change this, the way we are alive. And actually, we we must to do a tremendous effort in order to re-educate, if I can say that, the whole society. Um, I was thinking about your former question about this, the world, and specifically, the United States is doing enough for that. And the answer. No, again, because uh, we need the leadership of the United States in this issue. I know that there are a lot of troubles right now. Maybe most of, not only American, but also a lot of people are thinking how to recover economy, how to recover income, how to improve the conditions of their own economy. However, 
we should work together, uh, governments, uh, media, civil society, academy, in order to explain, again, the problems of climate change, in order to explain how important it is for our civilization. And we must try to put the issue in the top of the priorities again. Uh, it's really curious that we saw last year and even this year tremendous droughts in Africa, floods in Australia or Pakistan, fires in Russia, and even today maybe congressmen in the United States are trying to move tons of snow in their houses, mm -hmm. and they are saying, no, climate change is a myth. No, there is not climate change at all, and we need to change that. How can we do but We need to mobilize public opinion first. We need to explain again that first there is uh, an increase in carbon emissions in the world. There is an increase in global average temperature. There is uh, a correlation between global warming, carbon emissions, and global warming is provoking serious changes in the climate. And finally, that the, there are solutions related with the reductions of emissions and adaptations of the countries. But in order to do so, we need to mobilize a lot of resources, and mainly we need to change our style of life. And in order to do so, uh, we are not doing enough. And as Secretary General was saying, it is important the effort and the leadership of the developed countries, and I must say, the effort and leadership of the most developed countries, country in the world, which is the United States. Now, I'm sure that President Obama has, he realized the size of the problem, he understands that uh, he is facing a new Congress, a new political reality. However, it is not enough to understand that problem. We need to mobilize that society, the Congress, and of course, try to find out what could be the solution right now, according with this situation. And it, it Bill, take, Bill, I want you to take this up, Bill. Um, even with all the best innovation, do we and can we rewire people in a way that they will want less? That, that's not at all necessary, and thank okay. goodness. The, you cannot get a 90% CO2 emissions reduction by saying to the guy in India who uses two candles, you know, use one candle every two weeks, mm -hmm. or taking the nutrition levels that are typical in northern India and saying, yeah, you're going to have to cut back on this. They, there is no doubt more food and more energy, it's only just, it's appropriate, it will be used. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can say that the U.S. should cut back by a factor of two or even three, but it's a meaningless number compared to the justice of letting people mm -hmm. live have the type of communications, entertainment, uh, transport freedom that uh, developed countries have. So fortunately, that is not either A, a solution, or B, going to happen. We want people to live better lifestyles. And uh, all you have to do is make sure that the energy you're using isn't emitting CO2 or causing other problems. Um, and, Let's go and, uh, but I want to get some more questions, but go ahead quickly. Oh, yes, but, uh, but the point is uh, we can improve the conditions of the people, but the point is we need to do that in the more efficient way to use the dot energy. I know that no, it is no, impossible. You cannot you, – you have to make sure the energy you're using doesn't cause a problem. But yeah, you yeah, cannot but, 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 have but, a just world by telling those people no, yes, to use is, less energy – than no, the average no. European. No, but it, it's not a question if we are going to ask to those people to use only one candle. Of course, that people need electricity. But it is possible to switch, for instance, the traditional lamps in those houses, in millions of houses, in order to use saving energy lamps. And that is a very practical kind of measure that we need to take. Thanks. Let's go see if we can get a few more questions before we have to close. Uh, I, can't, um, I can't see that far. Anybody back there? This is an awfully shy audience. Um, we, uh, we, uh, Peter Corsell, are you out there? Where is, where, is, where is my friend Peter? Here, we got a question from Peter Corsell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so instructed. 
Well, you know, Tom, my question actually is, is for you. Um, you are one of the, uh, the most astute observers that I know of the U.S. political scene. And I, I can't hear you. As a, as a technologist in the clean energy space, it has certainly been a very disappointing period where we've not had national uh, comprehensive energy legislation. We've not seen a price on carbon and, and, and even the most sort of basic steps around providing the kind of technological framework that uh, Jim alluded to earlier. We've seen this sort of comical lack of consensus uh, in Congress. What is your view? I mean, I heard you say uh, 2013 at the earliest. What is your view on, on what it's going to take for the U.S. Congress to get serious um, in terms of implementing a technological framework that sends the signal to the market about, you know, what this clean energy future should look like, both in energy efficiency and clean energy generation? Well, yeah, I think it's a good point. I, I'm going to ask uh, uh, both Mike and Jim to take it up. I, I think it's either going to be uh, a signal from the market or Mother Nature. Uh, it's going to be a spike in oil prices uh, that all goes up to $200 a barrel. Um, or we get from Mother Nature what I call the perfect storm, a storm to finally end the debate about climate change that's so big, but not so big as it ends the world. Um, and uh, so that we can actually still do something about it. But I want to hear from uh, Mike and Jim, what would a more coherent, long-term framework around clean tech, which has been so missing, mean for you, for you at Walmart, Mike? First of all, uh, I'd say that business should not be sitting back waiting for government. Bus business can be leading in this area. And uh, this past year, we set our own aggressive greenhouse gas reduction objectives. We make it a part of our, our DNA, as I said. We start investing in renewable energy, and we can sit back and wait and debate and, and wait for government leaders, but I think as responsible business leaders, that's not productive. I think government could watch. What kind of response have you gotten from consumers? Actually, uh, frankly, I think it ends up li over time will lead to the appropriate response from consumers. I think in the short term, and particularly in mature markets, consumers are still under a great deal of personal pressure, jobs, uh, economies. And so I think right now they've got uh, things on their mind about feeding their own family and their own uh, livelihood. So it's probably not one that we're get, not getting a great deal of feedback. But in the long term, consumers are going to uh, provide the benefits to companies that take responsible action. I think in the future, customers will buy from responsible companies. Associates will work at companies that have a purpose. And, and I think that's how business wins in the future. And I think if we just sit back and wait for government, we will not be taking our responsibility seriously. Jim, what's your take on this? Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, the nexus of, of these issues is unambiguous. Uh, I mean, it's a linear relationship between GDP per capita and number of people and energy consumption. And that's just, and any way you look at the math, it's going up four or five X in the next 20, 30 years or something like that. And so we need a, a dramatic uh, adjustment here. And, you know, I, I just think that uh, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to have to rethink economics. We talk about food and, and I, the, the numbers I've been quoted, we, we make about eight times the food we need to feed the world, so this is a, this is a market breakdown. So somehow we're going to have to, um, you know, and, and, and the time I, I spent on this, um, everything comes back to political pressure. Uh, you, you know, and everybody's here is saying, give me political pressure, give me political capital, that's what I need. Uh, and so um, business is going to make money. Business can make money either through an adapted frame, e either through a modified framework or through a crisis of adaptation in a horrific set of scenarios. Business is business. Um, you know, the question is, uh, you know, what role does this forum want to play? I, I'm just, I just don't want false positivism because any way you look at the math, it's way, way worse. And the problem with innovation is, um, innovation is about creating energy. It's not about avoiding carbon because you're competing against two to three hundred billion dollars a year of fossil fuel subsidies. So carbon has, you know, it's negative valued. And so until you rethink economics, until you um, factor the public goods of social capital, which you, you, you've brought up, and you bring up natural capital, 
um, there's no chance. So, so, so I, I, I just think we have to be radically ambitious. Um, I think there's an enormous opportunity. Business is always going to make money. That's what it's here for. Um, I think this comes down to our intellectual capacities and what is the role of business and this forum in giving the political capital to the leaders to, to face and make the changes that everybody who spends a short period of time being briefed knows that the math is tough. Right. President Uriano, we, um, I don't want to leave you out. Is there anything you'd want to... Yes, I on just want things? to underline your point, Tom, that if we are talking about dealing with climate change, carbon global warming, what the world is doing now is not enough. We have to double our effort. We have to accelerate the process. And I fully agree that the developed countries must take the lead, but developing countries must do more as well. Uh, based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective ca uh, capacities. And lastly, if we are talking about sustainable development and also climate change, uh, about avoiding uh, food crisis, energy crisis, three things is very important, responding to the gentleman's question, lifestyle, need, not greed, and innovation and technology, and of course, correct and sound policies. Uh, practiced by governments out of all the world. That's my point. Thank President Calderon, you had a follow-up? I think that uh, one of the answers is public policies. And uh, as uh, he was saying, we need to reduce and eliminate the subsidies to fossil fuels. That is a very important step in public policies at international level, which is very costly in political terms in several countries, but we must do that. Second is pricing carbon, because the matter is, uh, I'm sure business is business, but if the governments are able to establish the right economic incentives, you can make business according with those economic incentives. And you, you need to, to, to pay more because of your technology, so probably you can switch your own technology in order to produce more efficient or you are going to use energy, maybe you can use not fossil fuels energy coming from that, uh, and we can uh, promote renewable energy. So th there are measures in which we can orient uh, the necessary growth and the necessary consumption of, of energy in order to make it more compatible with, or uh, more environmental friendly, if I can say that. So it is possible in terms of uh, public policies and international cooperation to do that. Of course, it is necessary the energy to grow. It is necessary to improve the conditions of the people. We are going to use even more energy than now, but it is possible to do in a better way. Well, you know, as I listen to all this and we, we draw to a close here, I hope uh, we can come back next year or the year after and, and uh, Secretary General, uh, you'll be presiding over uh, a different kind of competition. You know, we, during the Cold War, had a we had a space race. Who could be the first to put a man on the moon? And uh, only two countries could compete and only one could win. And it's clear to me right now we need, uh, we need the Earth race. Who can invent the most clean technologies so men and women can stay here on Earth? Uh, and I'd love to see Mexico competing you know, against Indonesia, Indonesia against Brazil, India, Russia, China, where everybody is trying to win that race. We'll all be better off. And hopefully we'll come here and be able to say, that actually a molecule of CO2 was actually affected by what we say and do here. Thank you very much. We need more than a molecule. <laughs>